Today's message is called Corral, Corral the Stallion. Corral the Stallion. What does it mean to corral a horse? Anybody know that word? It's, it's like kind of take them under control, isn't it? Put them in a pen, round them up. And today I want to talk to you about our thoughts and our words. And I want to suggest that the stallion is like our thoughts. And sometimes we need to be particularly intentional about bringing our thoughts into line. And the Bible has a lot to say about our thoughts. I want to um, flick this thing on. Um, Psalms 19 verse 14 is a beautiful scripture. And it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What an awesome passage that is. The words of my mouth, the words we speak, they have power. And the meditation of my heart, what I'm thinking of, has power. May it be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What a great name for God, by the way. Rock and redeemer. What does rock symbolize to you? Strength, stability, firmness, consistency. What does Redeemer tell you about God? Life-changing, yeah. Gracious, caring, rescuing. And so we've got this God who's a rock and a gracious Redeemer. Isn't that beautiful? And so what kind of thoughts and words would be pleasing to God and in line with his plan for our lives. I want to um, encourage you, if you have never come across the Joyce Meyer book called The Battlefield of the Mind, to get that book on audio or read it. Who here has already read the book Battlefield of the Mind? It's a, it's a powerful book, and it talks about how the spiritual battle, and in fact our whole life, everything to do with our life, takes place between our ears. Um, if you don't think it, it's never going to happen. And so why should we care so much about this? Well, it's because our thoughts control our lives. If we want to learn to have a good life, a godly life, we need to learn to manage our mind, manage our thoughts, win in this battle for our minds. You know, it's interesting. We're very um, specific about what we do with our money. We'll, we'll put a lot of thought into how we spend our money. We're also very specific, I think, in what we do with our time. We're very demanding on what we spend our time on. We can be very intentional about what we eat, what we, or at least we want to be, um, about what we put into our bodies. But how much intentionality do we put into what we think about or what we allow to flow through our brains? Are we just as diligent with governing that as we are with our bank account, say, for example? Because I think for a lot of us, thoughts come into our mind from all kind of places. And some of them are helpful and some of them are completely unhelpful. Some of them are a waste of time, some of them are destructive, some of them bring life. And I want to encourage you today to take God's word and manage your mind, make a decision, I'm going to take control over my thought life. Your mind is also the battleground for where sin will take place or righteousness will take place. So, for example, pride, that starts in the mind. Lust, that starts in the mind. Hatred, fear, which and then resentment, all these things are in the mind. Jealousy, worry, stress, all in our mind. You know, in Romans chapter 7, it says, I love to do God's will. Paul's talking about this battle in our mind, and he says, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned, but there's something else deep within me that's at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin within me. He says, in my mind, I want to be God's servant, but instead I find myself enslaved to sin. And so we have this battle going on in our minds. And if we're not intentional about it, we can just end up going with the flow. I want you today to have a bit of fun with me and say these words. I'm an anchor, not a cork. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, I'm an anchor, not a cork. I'm an anchor, not a cork. What am I talking about here? I've got a few pictures of cork up on the screen. Cork is an amazing type of wood. You know where it comes from? It comes from an, a cork oak tree, type of tree, an oak tree. And um, it's, it's a buoyant bark off this tree. So the cork is this external bark layer 
And did you know that they can strip the whole tree and it doesn't die? They have to be very careful. It's like a family trade. They have these little beautiful hatchets. They do it in Portugal and Spain. And they know just how much to whack the tree to go in just the right depth to cut off the dead bark. And they, they can peel it off in huge, beautiful sections. And then they chuck it down. And it's this, um, it's this waterproof wood. It doesn't absorb water. And that's why they put it in wine bottles and whatever. And that's why they float. And so... Did you know that they can re-bark, take the bark off these trees every nine years? And they have these huge oak forests and they'll climb up the tree and strip it off all the way up on the branches and everything like that. And it'll come off in these beautiful layers. And um, that's cork, amazing stuff. And it floats. Now some of us, if we're not careful, and let's be honest, it's me and all of us from time to time, our minds are just like a cork on the water. The wind blows this way, the tide moves that way, and our minds just go this way and that way. Um, we hear some distressing news, and all of a sudden we're panicking. Oh no, what are we going to do? The finances. My marriage is in trouble. I, well, did that person really mean... Did it, I heard this person say this, but did they mean this? Are they thinking that about me? And all of a sudden we're all wound up and stressed out and worried. And our minds are blowing this way and that way. And we... Um, and this can happen in our spiritual lives about God. Is I thought God was with me. But now some bad things have happened in my life. Maybe his promises aren't true anymore. All of a sudden, I, my faith is wishing around, swashing with the waves. I'm like a coke, uh, cork on the water, floating and wishing and washing all over the place. And so we have a choice, actually, whether we'll let our minds do that. And so... Um, the alternative is to be more of an anchor in life. And um, I'm going to try and find my anchor picture. Here it is. There's different types of anchors. And the bigger the boat, the bigger the anchor, right? And check out that anchor from that war battleship. That's a big chain, isn't it? And an even bigger anchor. Now, how does the anchor work? Well, they have a heavy chain and a heavy piece of metal on the bottom, but they also have these flukes, that's the pointy bit, and it's designed to jam in to the ocean floor. And do we have any sailors in the room, people who know how to handle boats? Um, apparently, it can take 20 minutes or half an hour to get your anchor set right, and so you need to be able to throw the anchor over, so over the side, and then you reverse a bit until the thing drags along and gets caught in the bottom. And if you do a really good job, it can be really hard to get it out when you actually want to move on. And so an anchor, what's the point of an anchor? Well, it's to keep you steady in a storm, right? And God wants us to learn to manage our mind so we can be steady in the storms of life. Storms of life are coming for all of us, right? And God is saying, don't let yourself be just like a cork on the water, blown this way and that way in your thinking. You need to take control of your mind. You need to corral the stallion. Your mind is a powerful thing, like a stallion, like a thoroughbred. But it needs someone who's brave enough to stand up to the wild beast and say, settle down, brains. Calm down a minute. You don't need to get upset about this. What did God's word say? And, some, and really, here's the thing. You're the only one who can ultimately do that for yourself. We all have a stallion of our own, and we're the only ones who can really say, get back in your pen, mind, settle down. Now, it can, there's things that you can choose to do to make it easier to do that. You can ask your friends to help you. You can put yourself in a positive environment, put on some positive music, go out for a run, try and break the pattern or whatever of a negative thought process, but at the end of the day, no one can force you to do that. You've got to choose to do that and to take responsibility for your mind. There's some um, great scriptures that I skipped over there. Let's go back and look at them. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants us to have our minds renewed, to be an anchor and not a cork. You know, this world that we live in is a battle. And we can easily forget that there's a spiritual realm, um, particularly living in the Western world. If you live in other countries, nobody's forgetting about that. But in our culture, it's easy to forget. And the facts are, the Bible says that Jesus is with us and um, his spirit is with us. And Jesus says, I am, what did he say? 
He said, I am a lot of things, but what's one of them? For today's topic, the relevant one is, I am the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Now, what did you, how did Jesus describe Satan, the devil? He said, the devil is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus knew how to um, burn someone when he needed to, and he did that to the devil. He said, he's a liar, he's the father of lies, and when he lies, he's speaking his native language. That's a, I think that's an appropriate burn for Satan. When that's, lying is his native language. And so what does the devil lie to us about? Well, he lies to you about who you are. He says you're not really valuable. He says you want to measure up? Well, you probably can't, but these are the things you should be scrambling after. And he sets us off in the wrong direction. And the devil is not the only thing that we've got to deal with. The Bible talks about three things that will send our minds into, into trouble. One is the devil. Another one is the world, which is a euphemism for ungodly truths. And the other one is our self, our flesh. And that's what we're reading about in Romans 7, when Paul says, I've got this battle within me. And so the world, what does the world tell us? Well, the Bible, um, the Bible describes the world in this symbolic way. It's not talking about the planet. It's talking about worldly concepts, such as what you might hear on the media. The message, you're only valuable in relation to what? Your looks, how beautiful you are, how much money you've got, how much power you've got, how much popularity you've got. That's what the message of the world is non-stop going to tell you that. Um, how about this one? You'll finally be happy if you get more. It's a lie. More is not what you need. There's other things you need, but more is not the solution to all your problems. How about this one? The whole point of your life is just for pleasure. That's your purpose in this life. So try and have pleasure as much as you can. That's a lie. That's not your purpose in this life. Um, we have a God, and our purpose is in relation to him. There's going to be pleasure along the way, for sure, but that's, an, that's a side effect. That's not our purpose. Um, we also have self-lies that are easy to believe, that the devil's happy for us to get waylaid with, and it's not what the Bible says. How about this one? I must have everyone's love and approval to be happy. I can't, you know, 99 people might think I'm great, but if one person thinks I'm an idiot, I can't sleep at night. There's this, everybody at work's nice, but there's one person at work who really doesn't like me and they're having a go at me all the time and I can't be happy knowing they're out there. The facts are, you can be happy with them out there and the facts are, not everybody loves you. <laughs> How brutal is that? But it's true. Not, anybody, not everybody loves me. Not everybody loves any of us. And you might say, well, that's because maybe it's because they just don't know us, but if they did know us, they would love us. No. <laughs> we get on each other's nerves. We don't like different things about each other. But you are still fantastic. The Bible says that you are worth so much that Christ would have come to earth to die to save you if you're the only one who ever got into hot water with sin and trouble. That's the Jesus we have. He loves us so much. And so we can, we can latch on to these things and we pick them up through life. Um, sometimes someone told us something when we were a kid and we believed it. It's not true, but it's become our reality because somehow it got in our heads. Maybe we were told as a kid, you're clumsy. And so somehow that, we latched on to that and now we live that out. Um, or you, you're always picked last for the sports team and you think, I'm, I'm not an athlete, sports are not for me, I'm, I'm an, and then it leads into a life of just being unhealthy. I'll never be healthy. I'll always be this way. Um, or maybe somehow the message got in there that you're always going to be financially struggling. I'll always be poor. That's just my lot in life. Other people have ways of getting ahead, but not me. It'll always be the same old struggles. Or what about that I'm a habitual warrior? Well, life's just full of problems, isn't it? I'm always going to be stressed. Isn't that God's... You know, the Bible says in this world will you, will, you will have trouble. You conveniently forget the other half that Jesus said, I came to give you peace, peace in the midst of that trouble. And so we can have these lies that are ruling our life and God is saying, I'm the truth and the truth will set you free. 
and we need to grab a hold of that with both hands. And sometimes when we try and do that, the lie that we're believing is like the, it's gotten into the stallion and the stallion goes berserk and does not want to be corralled. And so the, you can think of like the black stallion rearing up and going nuts and you have to just face it down and say, get back in there and you crack your stock whip, the word of God, and you tell that thing to get back under control. And it's sometimes that's easier said than done, but God is inviting us to ask for his Holy Spirit to help in the journey. You don't have to corral the stallion completely on your own. It's completely your choice, but the Holy Spirit will give you the power to bring it under submission. And it's an amazing thing that a small human being can look up at a massive horse and with a stock whip, they can bring that thing into submission. And the horse is way more powerful than 10 men, but it's going to be brought under control. And you might think, my worries, my fears, my anxiety, my temptations, my sin, my addictions, these things are like a wild stallion. There's no way I can bring it under control. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can bring it under control. You can be an anchor and stop being a cork when it comes to the battle in our mind. What about some other classic ones? I'll never be good enough. I'll always be overlooked. I'll always be left behind. Lie, lie, lie. You already are good enough. You don't have to do a single additional thing to impress God. He loves you already. Um, you're not overlooked by God, and he's not planning on leaving anyone behind. He's coming back especially to get you. The Bible says that he's in heaven right now, making a home with your name on it, specially designed for just what's going to be perfect for you for all eternity. And speaking of eternity, that's a great thing to think about when you're facing worries. Ask yourself, when I'm in heaven, a billion years from now, living in glory, how much is this challenge that I'm so stressed about right now going to really matter? How much is this challenge going to matter next week or this time next year? Will this drama that's all consuming me really matter? And, and these are things that we can ask ourselves to help that stallion get back under control. There's another thing to So we've got the world, we've got religious lies that we can, we can believe as well. Um, I must be perfect to be accepted by God. It's a lie. The only perfect person who was accepted by God was Jesus, right? And guess what? The rest of us, all imperfect, all also accepted by God. That's the truth. Um, so there's a ton of things that seem spiritual, but they're not the real truth of God. And the truth sets you free, whereas the lies of the devil keep you in bondage, and God's wanting to bring you freedom. Another important thing to understand is our own flesh will often tempt us, and temptation is not a sin, it's only acting on it that's a sin. So first of all, if you have a, a wild and crazy thought to do something completely wrong or a desire for something that you know is not right, don't beat yourself up about the arrival of that thought in your mind. It's what you do with the thought next that matters. And so you just simply need to take that thought and set it aside and say, I'm not going to live that out. And so temptation comes along and often it's an inflamed, healthy thing that is being misdirected. For example, food, our desire for food is a good thing, but we can overdo it, right? And so don't feel bad that you want to enjoy food. That's excellent. But there's a time and a place to say enough is enough and have a balance. Um, sex is the same. There's a right time and place for that and also an in, inappropriate place for that where our sinful desire can overcome and put it in the wrong perspective or place in our life. Even our desire to be loved by others can, is a good, healthy desire. We all should want to be loved by others and we should be loved by others. But we can let our ego get out of control and say, I must be the most special favoured above others, more important than everybody else. And that's where a good desire for love and attention is kind of grown into an ugly thing and it's putting other people down and everybody's incredibly valuable. And so, you know, you can see that when you, re when you recognise the origin of some of our temptations, it can be helpful in unlocking their power because we should fulfil the healthy desires without... Um, enabling the unhealthy side of it. Be an anchor and not a cork. Corral the stallion. 
Um, I want to share with you, and I want you to indulge me for a bit here, but um, one of my favourite poems, and I'm not really into poetry, but I just get Australian sentimentality wave over me in unusual and un unexplainable ways when I read the poem The Man from Snowy River. Any fans of this poem out there? You all know the poem, it's on our $10 note, did you know that? It's one of our things to stop counterfeiters ripping off our money. If you get a, if you get a $10 note and you blow it up, the whole poem's written out multiple times on the $10 note, The Man from Snowy River. And I want you to think about that as an analogy for what God is inviting us to do with the power of the Holy Spirit to stand down our thought life when it gets out of control. For those of you who don't know it, I'm going to just indulge me and go along with this. The Man from Snowy River was written in 1890. Now, what's going on in Australia in 1890? Well, around about then, um, Ron and Delmer's granddad went out to Brown's, what is now Brown's Road, and bought hundreds of acres of Australian bushland. Is that right? Would have been around then. And um, now we have Brown's Road, and, and the whole family's been blessed from, and our whole church has been blessed from that time um, through those guys. Around about then, Ellen White came to Australia, and she went on horseback from college all over the hill one day to Maitland to visit the church plant that started up there. It wouldn't be for another 10 or 15 years yet that Wall's End would be planted out of, I think, the Hamilton Church, which was probably the first one, as far as I know, in Newcastle. And so we're talking a long while ago when people still travelled by horse, and um, Australia wasn't even, hadn't had federation yet. We're still these colonies, but Australian identity was forming. And um, this poet, Banjo Patterson, writes from some of his own experiences. And it seems that it probably took place, the story takes place in the, in the wild hills around Canberra. And you get the story of the man from Snow River. And the gist of it is, you have this incredible, expensive horse that's colt has gotten away. And it's worth a thousand pounds. And they've got to try and catch it. And who knows who's able to rein in the stallion. People think it can't be done, but they want to do it. And it's gotten in with the wild brumbies, and they're worth money too. And so everyone's come out who can ride a horse, and they're mustering for the challenge. And so I'm going to just read you some of the poem. Is that all right today? I want you to put your thought in mind about the things in your life that are hard to rein in, different fears that we have, different temptations we may face, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be the man from Snow River. And so I want you to enjoy this with me. There was movement at the station, for the word had passed around that the cult from old regret had got away. And it joined in with the wild bush horses. He was worth a thousand pound. So all the cracks had gathered to the fray. All the tried and noted riders from the stations near and far had mustered at the homestead overnight, for the bushmen love hard riding, where the wild bush horses are, and the stock horse snuffs the battle with delight. And isn't it a battle when we're trying to control our thoughts? And so I'll skip a bit here, but you get introduced to Harrison, the old champion rider. He's the old man with white hair, but still the best. And Clancy of the Overflow, the best of the best. And then there were, and one was there, a stripling on a small and weedy beast. He was something like a racehorse, undersized, with a touch of Timor pony, three parts thoroughbred at least, and as such are by mountain horsemen prized. He was hard and tough and wiry, and that's what we've got to be sometimes with our mind as it's wandering off. Just the sort that won't say die. And there was courage in his quick and impatient tread, and he bore the badge of gameness in his bright and fiery eye and the proud and lofty carriage of his head but still so slight and weedy, one would doubt his power to stay. And the old man said, that horse will never do. For a long, tiring gallop, lad, you'd better stop away. Those hills are far too rough for such as you. Sometimes that's the message we get from life, isn't it? You're not good enough. You can't do it. Nice try, kid, but stay back on the bench. 
That's not God's truth for you. He's got a different plan with your name on it. So he waited, sad and wistful. Only Clancy stood his friend. I think we ought to let him come, he said. I warrant he'll be with us when he's wanted at the end. For both his horse and he are mountain bred. He hails from Snowy River, up by Kosciuszko's side, where the hills are twice as steep and twice as rough, where a horse's hoofs strike firelight from the Flintstones every stride. The man that holds his own is good enough. So they say, all right, you can come. And so off they go. I'm going to skip a few uh, paragraphs here. But they go for the race, and they catch up. They see the Brumbies, and they can see the, old, uh, the cult from Old Regret is among them. And the chase goes on, and it's a terrific ride, and everybody's after him, and Clancy's out doing his stuff. But they can see that it, they're coming to a steep mountain, and then they're racing up the mountain, and they think if those... If those Brumbies go down the other side, they're as good as gone. And the old man says, we're done. And when they reached the mountain summit, even Clancy took a pull. We might as well make the boldest, it might well make the boldest hold their breath. You see, they come to this edge of this precipice. And the wild hop scrub grew thickly, and the ground, and the hidden ground was full of wombat holes, and any slip was death. But the man from Snowy River let the pony have his head. He swung his stock rip round and gave a cheer. And he raced him down the mountain like a torrent down its bed, while the others stood and watched in very fear. He sent the flint stones flying, but the pony kept his feet. He cleared the fallen timber in his stride, and the man from Snowy River never shifted in his seat. It was grand to see the mountain horsemen ride. Through the stringy barks and saplings on the rough and broken ground, down the hillside at a racing pace he went, and he never drew the bridle till he landed safe and sound at the bottom of that terrible descent. He was right among the horses as they climbed the further hill, and the watchers on the mountain, standing mute, saw him ply the stock whip fiercely as he was right among them still, as he raced across the clearing in pursuit. Then they lost him for a moment, where the two mountain gullies met, in the ranges, but a final glimpse reveals. On a dim and distant hillside, the wild horses racing yet, they're still going, with the man from Snowy River at their heels. And he ran them single-handed till their sides were white with foam. And he followed like a bloodhound on their track till they're halted, cowed and beaten. Then he turned their heads for home and alone, unassisted, brought them back. You know, the Bible says you haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. And some of us get to the brink of that cliff and we say, it's too much, I've been here before, no one will live if we go down there. But God is saying, corral the stallion, he's with you, he's the Holy Spirit, he's given you the whip to crack, and it's your choice to face some of those demons, those fears, those temptations that have controlled, had sway over your mind for too long. And God is saying, with me, all things are possible. Go for it. And God is wanting to encourage you to put your trust in him. And God's got um, a man from Snow River in every one of us to go down the mountainside and pull those wild and raging fears and thoughts and temptations back into line by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we talk ourselves out of a miracle. God led the Israelites to the edge of the promised land. They had every reason to believe that God would protect them. But these spies went in, and you know, the power of words is amazing. They come back and they said, we saw the people who lived in that land, and we're like grasshoppers compared to them, and fear spread through the crowd. People listened to it, the power of words, and it got under their skin, and they doubted God. Caleb and Joshua said, no. Nope. God's gotten us this far, we can keep going. And you know, the whole nation doubted the power of God, but God honoured Caleb and Joshua, and they lived through the whole 40-year wilderness, you know, going in circles, and God granted them blessing in the promised land because they chose to believe. You know, Jesus, anointed with the Holy Spirit, it's the season for his ministry, he's healing people all over, and he goes back to Nazareth, and they talk themselves out of a miracle. And Jesus is shocked because he's planning on doing miracles in his hometown. And they said, isn't this Joseph's boy, the carpenter's son? 
Don't we remember him mucking around here playing soccer as a kid? How's he going to help us? And so they, they talked themselves out of it. At first they were amazed, it said, but then they talked and talked and they said, nah, he's nobody special. And, and said that because of their lack of faith, Jesus did very few miracles there and, and very little happened. Now take another situation. Jesus um, is on his... Somebody comes to Jesus, a father with a dying daughter, and they say, come and heal my daughter. And he goes, all right, I will. And so Jesus starts walking there, but on the way he gets interrupted and there's a woman in the crowd, remember this? And she reaches through the pressing crowd and just thinks, if I can just touch Jesus, there's some faith for you. She's corralled her fears and channeled them instead in her mind and attention on Jesus. And that's what we need to do. We need to reach out to Jesus when the fears and temptations are pressing in. And she reaches out, touches Jesus, and just like that, and this is a little insight into the supernatural world, the Bible says Jesus said he felt power go out from him. I'm, uh, that's fascinating. And then the woman is just felt in her body instantly healed. And Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciple says, what are you, crazy? Everybody's touching you. You're in a squashy crowd. And then Jesus said, no, I, I felt someone touch me. It was a special touch of faith. Has Jesus felt you reach out and touch him because he wants to? You've got some issues in your life that Jesus wants to have the feeling of his power going to you. Don't hang on to it on your own anymore. Get to the edge of the precipice. Bring your fears, worries, temptations, challenges to God and reach out in faith. Jesus wants to feel his power going into you for a miracle. And they have this beautiful moment where Jesus says, your faith has healed you. But then another part of the story. The dad comes along. Uh, the dad's still standing there and a messenger of death appears. This man is a messenger of death because he's bringing a message that your daughter is dead. And he says, don't trouble the teacher anymore. Just go. And Jesus is standing there. The dad's there. The healed woman's there. The messenger of death is there. And Jesus looks at the dad and says, don't be afraid. Just believe. It's the man from Snowy River at the top of the precipice. Clancy's even stopped. The other guy said, you didn't have it in you. What are you going to do? Jesus says the words, don't be afraid, just believe. What do you do with your brains at that moment when you get the message from the messenger of death of something that's devastating to you? Where do you look? Do you look at the messenger of death or do you look at the evidence of Jesus' power that's also standing right next to you right now? Because I believe Jesus put evidence of his power in your life that you can look to when you need faith. There'll be something there. And if that man turned his head, he could see a woman who had been sick for 14 years. What is he going to choose to think about? The messenger of death or the woman who just got healed right before his eyes? The Bible doesn't say what he chose to look at, but we know that he went with Jesus. Other people would just give up, but he went with Jesus. Jesus goes to the home. People are crying. Talk about battlefield of the mind. How easy would it be to just give up? Now, let's not kid ourselves. I don't believe for a second that him or any of us have perfect faith. But guess what? How much faith does God say we need for a big miracle? A speck. He said, you need as much faith as a speck of a mustard seed. That's all you need. You don't need to have it all worked out. You just need to say, I've got enough to jump over the edge of the precipice. Yeah! Crack the stock whip. Put your trust in the Holy Spirit. He hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. I'm going. And so he goes. Jesus walks into the room. He shoes out these mourners. He doesn't want the sound of doubt around. Sometimes you need to get the voice of the mourners out of your life. You've got some nagging doubters that are dragging you down. You need to take control of your environment. Be careful what you put in your mind and make sure. That's why we say get up in the morning and start the day with prayer. Start the day with reading God's word. You need to fill your mind with God's truth from the beginning of the day. Learn his beautiful promises. So when <coughs> the mourners are there, you can identify them, make them a scenario change so their voice is not, and you're able to hear the voice of truth, the voice of freedom. God's truth. 
right there with you. And then so they get shooed out, and Jesus is there, and he says to the little girl, get up. That's how hard it was for him. Little girl, get up. She gets up, totally fine. Dead a moment ago, alive right now. Hugs mum and dad, it's the best thing ever. What did it take? Just a speck of faith. But I think that's hard enough. Let's just be honest. I think that's hard enough. When you are standing in front of a wild stock horse of fear, of doubt, of temptation, it's going bananas. It's just enough that you just stand your ground. And that's all you need. Because the devil and his fears, it's mainly just hot air. And God can, um, you know, give it a moment with God. And the Bible says, when um, you're attacked by the devil, stand firm, resist, and um, the devil will flee from you. And God will lift you up and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Be an anchor, not a cork. Be the man from Snowy River. Crack the stock whip of the Holy Spirit. Start your day filling, feeding your mind with God's word. He's wanting you to live this beautiful life of purpose. Can you stand and pray with me? Let's ask God to help us win in the battle in our mind. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it's easier said than done, but thank you for the voice of truth that says, with God, all things are possible. And I pray that you would fill our mind with your truth. We know that the world around us, our own flesh and the devil, are trying to fill our mind with all kinds of other garbage. Help us to be just as intentional about our thought life as we are about our money, our finances and other important decisions, what we spend our time on. Help us to do what the Bible says and take every thought captive and be obedient to Christ. But there's no way we can do it on our own and we need the stock whip of the Holy Spirit to give us the power to do that. So if you would like today for this prayer to be for you, to have a breakthrough in your mind, overcoming fears, overcoming temptation, overcoming doubts or worries or anxiety, overcoming battles that you've had, strongholds of false beliefs about who you are as a person or any other thing that you know, I don't really believe that, but I, I keep coming back to that false truth. If you want a breakthrough, I invite you to lift your hand right now and while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you're saying, yes, God, I want to, I want to step out in faith. I want you to be that stock whip, putting, um, sending the devil and, and these false truths into flight and giving me the power to corral my mind so to live in the light of your truth instead of in the light of lies. And Lord, we're sick of that sort of life. We want to live the abundant life that you promised, the life of freedom, the life of joy, the life of peace, the life of strength. You are our rock and our redeemer. Help us to speak words of life and think thoughts of life to bless us, you and the world around us. And we pray for these miracles to take place in Jesus' name. Amen.